We welcome now our good friend, the executive vice president of the National Taxpayers Union, Pete Sepp. Pete, welcome back. Great to be here. So, Pete, what do you think of this kind of, of statement? Because I think this really goes to the heart of what President Obama not only said, but what he believes and he has tried to do. It was a debate between then-candidate Senator Obama and Senator Hillary Rodham Clinton. Charles Gibson of ABC asked him about the capital gains tax and mentioned the fact that, hey, we dropped this thing. You got more revenue. So why would you raise it if you're getting more revenue, in essence? Here is part of that exchange. It's clip number 20, if I'm not mistaken. And when that's ready, let me know. It is something we we also have gone with the spread your wealth around. We've heard that. We took some calls on the tax code earlier in the broadcast. So... Pete, do we have clip 20 ready? Roll it. Bill Clinton in 1997 signed legislation that dropped the capital gains tax to 20 percent. And George Bush has taken it down to 15 percent. And in each instance, when the rate dropped, revenues from the tax increased. The government took in more money. And in the 1980s, when the tax was increased to 28 percent, the revenues went down. So why raise it at all, especially given the fact that 100 million people in this country own stock and would be affected? Well, Charlie, what I've said is that I would look at raising the capital gains tax for purposes of fairness. We saw an article today which showed that the top uh, 50 hedge fund managers made $29 billion last year. $29 billion for 50 individuals. Uh, and. Part of what has happened uh, is that those who are able to work the stock market and amass huge fortunes on capital gains are paying a lower tax rate than their secretaries. That's not fair. So tell me, Pete, how has President Obama now twice elected? He's a two-termer. How has he pursued that type of fairness how's it worked with a vengeance he has pursued it to the maximum with the capital gains tax rate indeed the rate has gone up it was 15 percent top rate under george w bush's tax cut laws in fact there was a zero percent rate for many middle class americans as far as declaring capital gains went Uh, so the rate has gone up Not only is the top rate 20% now, there is also a surtax, thanks to the Affordable Care Act, that makes the rate just shy of 24%. So a major boost in the rate. We're going to see just how long the growing economy, and it's growing at a very slow pace, will possibly bring in more revenues from capital gains before these rates finally start to discourage people, especially those at the top, from taking risks and investing. You know, it's pretty horrible when you hear that clip played from so many years ago, and the president is basically saying, because he's angry at 50 hedge fund managers making what he believes to be too much money, well, millions of Americans are going to have to get punished in the name of fairness. That's pretty much what it comes down to. What's the most misleading aspect or element of the inequality debate, in your opinion? I think the most misleading aspect, number one, uh, (laughs) I have many, but (laughs) you can can list multiple. I I think the, the most misleading aspect has to be the ignorance of history, the fact that when you keep tax rates low for everyone, not just the middle class, not just those on the lower end of the income scale, but those on the upper income scale, you you don't necessarily have to have the same rate for everyone. I think a flat tax would be a great idea, but even if you don't subscribe to that, immoderate tax rates produce lower revenues, 
less economic gain, less advancement for everyone, not just the wealthy that are targeted by the rates. And Charlie Gibson had it right on the money. The fact is that when capital gains tax rates were reduced under Bill Clinton, capital gains revenues rose. When capital gains tax rates were increased under Ronald Reagan, by the way, through the 1986 Tax Reform Act, revenues dropped. Realizations plunged the year following the 1986 Act by double digits. So when we look at the tax code and we talk about production, that's the uh, people working more, producing more, maybe sometimes with technology working less and, and hiring less. Nonetheless, they are producing more. It's not a bad thing. It actually provides capital for other places in development and a whole host of things. That, that all said, my question to you is, it, historically, do we have a direct... Co- a correlation that could be cause that that we could go to a causation in the sense of when you lower taxes, people will work harder. They'll work more. They'll work more hours. They'll produce more. Oh, absolutely. In fact, as we were discussing last night, there was a tax rate reduction. This was across the board for people at the top end of the income scale as well as the bottom end that was enacted after John F. Kennedy's death. Kennedy had proposed an across-the-board income tax rate reduction, and he said one of the principles behind this plan was to provide additional reward for additional effort. So even he was saying that if you keep tax rates low or reduce them from high levels, you're going to increase the incentives for productivity. That's exactly what happened. There were two studies uh, taken during the Johnson era after the tax rate reductions were put into place, and they found that gross national product measurably increased as a result of the rate reductions. The em- employment, uh, unemployment rate, I should say, actually decreased by nearly one full percentage point as a result of the tax reductions. One full percentage point is a lot. Can you imagine if the tax rate, uh, if the unemployment rate, for example, dropped one full percentage point today? Economists would be doing handsprings. <laughs> that's, now, that's an image. Speaking of economists, when we talk about economists, we hear the president, Jay Carney, I'll talk about these economists. These economists told us Obamacare would work. The stimulus would work. They told us that the financial regulatory reform known as Dodd-Frank would help. Is, can, when I look at economists and, and, and think, okay, well, either something works or something doesn't work, I get the idea that maybe their ideological sway one way or another with the way they are swayed either to the left and i wouldn't call it liberal because i will get confused with liberal economics and what truly is uh, classical liberal but if we go with the left versus the right I, I i'm curious how could people who are so bright i mean i hey i like the first grade so much i repeated it pete but it's not too difficult to understand the two plus two equals four and not five. What are these economists smoking, pardon me, to come up with the fact that government spending, higher taxation, will produce a better economic environment where people will be employed? Hold on. Where people will be employed, etc. Yeah, it's Hmm. very interesting. You know, far be it for me to agree with Robert Reich on anything, but I think he makes an interesting point that economies are made up of human beings interacting that don't always boil down to the science of economics. He's absolutely right, but you're also absolutely right. It's very difficult to say that a given policy has produced a desired result. There are lots of causes for a rebounding economy, for example, 
You can attribute some of it to good fiscal policy, other parts to good regulatory policy, so on and so on. But for failures, the evidence is a lot more direct and a lot more stark, because if you claim that enacting a stimulus package of $862 billion will create a whole bunch of jobs, lift the economy out of its doldrums, and not exert a negative impact years down the road because of all the borrowing that had to precipitate it. And suddenly the numbers come in, and the unemployment rate did not drop as expected, and GDP growth did not occur as expected, and the debt rose to $17.5 trillion. Well, that's pretty much evidence that your assertion of success didn't pan out. <laughs> Okay, well then it becomes the job of the mainstream media, or excuse me, the dinosaur media, the the establishment media. But these are, I can do it a click of a button. I can look and I can say, okay, well, here's what's worked historically. Here's what has not worked. And when somebody puts forth a policy, I would have them address, okay, why would you put something forward that does not work? And it seems to me we either have a willfully ignorant media, and for that matter, those on the left are willfully ignorant of what they are putting forth and, in the sense of, go back with the media, asking about and not challenging. I, I, that's what I say. I, I can't really think of it as something else other than the fact that they know what they're doing and they just want more government more inefficiency and pe more people unemployed. Now, I don't believe, I, I, I don't see into their hearts, but I don't want to put that in there. I, so are they willfully ignorant? I mean, think about the wage gap baloney. Yeah, I, I think that some of it has to do with the salespeople that pitch these things. Uh, you know, you get President Obama in office riding an electoral wave saying, we're going to have hope and change. And the main theme, and you see this with the economic policies of every president who's proposing something that's failed in the past, they say, this time it's going to be different, and here's why. And that's exactly what we were told with the Obama administration stimulus package. Remember, he and Joe Biden got up before the nation and said, we will not tolerate wasteful pork barrel spending in this stimulus package. My goodness, we're going to get it right this time. We won't waste any tax dollars <laughs> on make-work projects. Look here in the package. It says there's a prohibition on spending any stimulus funds on zoos or golf courses or aquatic parks. See, we're being careful with the money. Well, it just didn't work out that way. We got things like Solyndra instead. And even the non-Solyndra, supposedly legitimate projects, just didn't stimulate the economy the way it was projected. But it was packaged differently. So packaging, yeah, I can see that to a point. But then, well, I, I think we go into that area where they are knowingly misleading us or they're just not experienced enough in the private sector to understand that these things don't work. They don't recognize human nature. That's the function of government. It's easy not to recognize it because then you'd have to recognize your own and your th thirst for power and to increase your power. And, hey, it's real easy to get people to vote for you if you're paying them. But I digress. I want to go to what you found out about the tax code complexity because we, we took some calls last hour regarding this, and it, it is – something that we all are concerned about. I will tell you that we've had our taxes professionally done. I've had them done even when I was, it cost me more than <laughs> I would pay in taxes to, to have it professionally done because I never wanted a problem with the IRS. I was concerned about that because of their power and their overreach and the, and the potential for abuse. I know I'm in the Neverland here, but to, to think they would target people. This was obviously before Lerner, years, decades before. But now, let me ask you something. How complex is the code, and does that add, what, what does that tell us about our tax system and our government? 
gap. So the one number to remember from this study that we have conducted called a taxing trend, and we've been doing this for 16 years now, <laughs> the one number to remember, $224.3 billion with a B. That is the cost of compliance with our federal, personal, and corporate income tax system. Only the federal system, only the federal income tax, not the payroll tax, not the excise tax, not state and local taxes. That's $224 billion in the value of time and out-of-pocket costs for things like software and printer ink and self-help books on taxation. That is what it costs just to comply with the system. And you get an idea of the kind of deadweight loss that the income tax laws impose on our economy. And once you understand that, you realize that tax reform could be an engine for economic growth, even if not a single tax rate or tax burden gets cut or shifted on the American people. If we just make it simpler to comply with the tax system, we will make economic gains because the money we are wasting now on compliance can be spent on something more productive. Let's talk. Incidentally, I don't know if it's okay to do this, but could I post this, the thing you sent me, on the Fast Facts on tax complexity on the Facebook? Oh, yes, absolutely. That, that's what I like to do because it, it, it's absolutely fascinating. National Taxpayers Union Executive Vice President Pete Sepp. Now, Pete, let's, let's do kind of a rapid fire here. Fair Fair share. We heard a lot about secretaries paying more than CEOs, effective tax rates, etc. Tell me, what does the top 1% pay? As far as federal income taxes go, almost 40% of all federal income taxes, they account for an income share of 20%. Bottom line, they are hauling twice the load in taxes versus what they actually make in income. What is the top... 10% pay. Top 10% pays upwards of two-thirds of all federal income taxes. How about the bottom 40%, 43% maybe? Well, if you look at 40%, they pay practically nothing. Now, the bottom half of income earners account for about 3% 3, 3 of all federal income tax receipts. They account for about 15% of all the income earned. So if you take a, a look at that statistic, compare it to the top 1%, you see this is an extremely progressive tax system. And that's based on data before the tax rate increases of 2013 took full effect. Once we find out the actual IRS data for, say, 2013 and 2014, I think we'll see an even wider degree of progressivity that liberals love in our tax code. Flat tax, fair tax, are they possible to fund our government? Is it, could it be a reality? They are economically and practically quite feasible. You could either abolish the tax system we have now in favor of a national consumption tax or dramatically reshape the tax system so you have a wide, simplified base of income and a single rate it applies to and a large exemption based on the family size. That way, a middle-class family, for example, of four people would pay no tax on the first roughly $40,000 of income. After that, you pay 17%. A $40,000 deduction is not going to be worth much to someone like Bill Gates, who is worth over $80 billion. So he's going to pay 17% on however much that $86 billion generates in annual uh, income, and the family of four will pay 17% on what's left over 40000 uh, Rather, uh, not quite a progressive system, but certainly a proportional tax system. Final question. You could do one thing with the tax code. What would you do? What change? I would make it much more transparent. Whatever system we enact, 
needs to be one where people can see either on their cash register receipt or mm -hmm. on a form they file every year how much their government costs them. These things like withholding from paychecks deliberately obscures the amount of money we pay for our government, and we fail to question the value we are getting for the money we send to Washington, D.C., and that value is terrible. Pete Sepp, National Taxpayers Union Executive Vice President, great to be with you. Thank you, my friend. Take care, sir. Take care. Crane Durham's nothing but truth. Well, we try to get it all in in 90 minutes. Sometimes we make it. Sometimes we run out mid-speech. It happens. But let me tell you this. You can go to the American Family Radio Facebook page of Crane Durham's Nothing But Truth. Please like the page, engage, and in the debate, have fun, be respectful, no cursing. Here's a closing thought. What? The, oh, when I talk about the hate squad? All right, I'll address this real quick. Do I think the Westboro Baptist Church or the KKK, KKK has blood on its hands historically? It's a horrible organization. I am talking about the ideological idea in these groups and challenging them on their ideology on that and grouping them. That's why I call them the hate squad. No, I, I think obviously you have the KKK has done heinous things in the past and people in their name have done th heinous th I mean, yeah, blood-wise, yeah, disgusting. No, I'm speaking to the general of the hate and addressing that. Okay, just so you understand. Not minimizing the blood of the KKK is disgusting and horrible. Crane Durham's Nothing But Truth. Do me a favor. Live with honor in your life, passion in your heart, and always keep the faith in Jesus Christ. God knows you. He loves you. He created you. And you're worth it. Wherever you're at, you're worth it. Look forward to seeing you all tomorrow. Crane Durham's Nothing But Truth, AFR Talk.